Good afternoon to you. Mark's out of HurricaneTrack.com here. Time for the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion. It's August 24th, 30 years now after Hurricane Andrew. This, though, 2022. Good to have you along with me. We're going to talk about this. Is August going to be a shutout? Time to kind of face the music here and acknowledge the fact that things are not going according to, not the plan, but the forecast. The forecast was for a very busy season, and it has been anything but. And I'm going to try to talk about a few theories as to why this is happening and what might happen in September and October. A couple of other people I have seen kind of bringing this up, and I'm going to mention it today as well. And, of course, we will look back at Hurricane Andrew. I found a really good resource to share with you. I'll show you with that towards the end of today's update. All right? All right, so National Hurricane Center outlining a couple of areas. This one east and southeast of the Windward Islands. This one coming off of Africa. There's another area in between. Um, well, there was. There's just two now, and that makes sense. So only a couple of areas to watch in the Atlantic Basin. Nothing in the Pacific. That little system that was sitting out here, gone, dissipated. It's out of there. All right, so what do we got here? Satellite, that's right, satellite animation today. Um, I mentioned this in my What's Up segment this morning, this upper level low to the south and west of Bermuda, which is right there. Uh, a lot more shower and thunderstorm activity with it, but nothing that even resembles organization. I think the upper level low is actually spinning down here more, um, and there's another upper level low sitting over here. We've just got this tut carved out through here. Roughly, that's where it is, tropical upper tropospheric trough, and that is cold air in the atmosphere, cyclonic motion and a lot of air that's converging and it's not favorable at all for development and on the southwest side of it over here or the southern side you can get some wind shear and uh, again this is kind of an oversimplification of it but you can kind of tell what you're looking at if you've done this long enough and that is definitely that sort of tut feature sitting out there this is the area that we will be watching closely as it moves out of the southwest tropical atlantic and across the windwards here and eventually it might try to come to life over in the Western Caribbean. I'm going to show you a tweet from Jack Sillen. Hadn't heard from him in a while uh, that explains this pretty good there. But that's what we'll be watching. Uh, this was what was 90L. Look how this is just not moving. Stuff out here is just kind of stuck. It is one of the darndest things that I have seen in a long, long time. You don't have a lot of strong high pressure out over the eastern tropical Atlantic to just keep everything moving along. So stuff comes out, it kind of runs into each other. you got this big monsoon trough sitting out there, this large envelope of, uh, it's like a cyclonic embryo, if you will, and within it, stuff tries to get going, but there's just so much energy out there that not one singular item can bundle up and take off. And then you add to that this dry air that keeps getting injected down into the deep tropics because of what we've heard this year. It's not a new term, but people have been throwing it around a lot. It's called wave breaking, um, and I'll show you why I think that's happening in just a minute. But you've got this big area of high pressure up over the North Atlantic, and that is sending down this drier, more stable air from the Northeast Atlantic, some of it coming off of Africa, but it is not the Saharan air layer per se that is causing all of this stability in the deep tropics and you know you start to wonder though how is this missed when all of the models the computer guidance for the the climate models for the season was indicating a very favorable pattern remember the euro back in june forecasting an ace of over 200 not gonna happen i mean i don't think it will not at this point we'll get to that more in a moment all right so the vorticity i love this map uh, by the way this is what was over here a couple of days ago, now it's causing a tremendous amount of rain all across portions of the I-20 corridor and you know many dozens of miles either side of that through parts of Louisiana and especially in the Mississippi. I'm sure you've seen the dramatic flooding, unfortunately, uh, that has resulted from that. And, and this is partly due to a lot of this deep tropical air that is coming up out of the tropics, of course. And you've got this frontal boundary and this little piece of vorticity that has helped to set that off. That's kind of the match on the gasoline vapors, if you will, that lets that explode into these very heavy tropical thunderstorms uh, over parts of the deep south there. But anyway, that's the upper level low right there. 
starting to show some lower level vorticity, a little bit of spin and energy closer to the surface. Keep in mind, this is, I'll draw your attention down here, 850 millibars. That is about 5,000 feet up in the atmosphere. And you know, remember the atmosphere is built up of layers, like onions. Remember Shrek? Well, unfortunately in Shrek they didn't reference meteorological layers. That would have been funny for us, but nobody else would have gotten it. So Donkey talks about, and, and um, Shrek there, onions and cakes and whatever, but it's true. The atmosphere, now everybody's going to be hungry or think about onions and cry. Um, the atmosphere is made up of layers, and this part of the atmosphere, 5,000 feet or 850 millibars, is where I like to look and see what the structure is like. It is a satellite product. This is a satellite picture, but it's different. It's kind of like looking at an x-ray. It's not the same thing at all, but I'm just giving you an analogy here. Um, you can see through the clouds, so to speak, kind of like seeing through your soft tissue, so you can see your bone structure or whatever. This sees through the clouds, and what's going on underneath those clouds? Is there low-level spin happening or vorticity, the relative vorticity in this case? And yeah, there is a little bit there to the south and west of Bermuda, right there. And then there's this. Now that's pretty stout. You, know, you look at that and you go, all right, there's a pretty good chunk of energy there. It's starting to bundle up a little bit better. Certainly more prominent than it was yesterday. Yet the models have really backed off, or say the model, the GFS, was really going gangbusters with this as it came through the Eastern Caribbean. You guys saw it. We talked about it yesterday. It had a lot of people um, sort of chattering about it across all sorts of social media. And um, it doesn't look like it's going to do much right now. Yet, there is the energy down there. So the energy is there. The seedling is there. And we'll have to watch that as we progress. And then some energy sitting out here in the deep tropics. We're going to watch this area more in the coming days to see what comes off of Africa. But stuff's just moving so slow. It's so weird. Anyhow, this is the tweet that I was telling you about. Uh, Jack Sillen mentioning... Uh, heads up, he says, that the impending Caribbean wave is crossing straight through the region highlighted during the GFS V16 evaluation. This is just fancy talk for when the modelers, the geniuses that come up with this stuff, and they are, they are far sm uh, smarter than me, um, they create these models and they look and see where are their false alarms, where are their biases, where are their problems, and one of them in the latest modeling that we've got, the GFS V16, uh, that this region that the wave was going to go through was especially prone to false alarms, the operational, in that model. And we were seeing that in the GFS recently. Would not be surprising to see recent trends towards a weaker system continue. And it was down here in the southeastern Caribbean Sea. Uh, follow Jack there on Twitter, and he's got a thread all about this. Uh, we could talk about it for an hour, but I just wanted to point this one part out that, that it's in there. People know about this. There is a false alarm ratio, and this system was entering that area, and the GFS was just kind of jumping on it a little bit prematurely there. All right, a couple of other things to point out, and again, going to acknowledge that things should be busy, but they are not. So, you know, no more, well, the switch is going to flip. Uh, wait, wait, wait. We're in that. We're there. We are where we should be climatologically, and stuff isn't happening. So let's try to figure out why. And then, again, it is only late August. This is not the end of October, and we've had nothing. There are still two whole months plus a week of peak time of the hurricane season left and we don't want to just walk away and say nothing is going to happen. I doubt we're going to have the hyperactive season. It's still possible. Um, but to say that we're going to have nothing is also foolish. All right? So let's set the stage here. We are currently in a favorable phase of the Madden-Julian Oscillation. Let me use blue here just to highlight this. So here's where we are now. And this is where the euro and its ensembles show that we're going. That's the ensemble mean back into the null phase pretty quickly here. So a brief period of supposed favorability in phases one and two, and that favors, it should, 
the Western Hemisphere, off of Africa, the Indian Ocean, that vicinity, and the JMA, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, a little bit more amplified, maybe even substantially more so, uh, and then right back into the null phase, meaning no discernible MJO activity uh, once that gets into that circle right there. And then some of the guidance indicating that it, the MGO might amplify back over towards the Western Pacific. We'll see. Bottom line is we are apparently in a more active upward motion pattern, and I can show you that. I can demonstrate that for you that we are seeing it, and I can prove it. Look, there is more convection. There is more upward motion in the atmosphere all around here in the Western Hemisphere. It's not like everything is just blank out there and all there is are stratocumulus clouds like this everywhere. Nothing is consolidating, though. We don't have that low-level convergence and solid spin at the surface to generate a surface low and then generate a tropical cyclone. That part is not happening. It's kind of like having all the pieces to a, a car, a machine, an engine, whatever, but... It's just not coming together. You can't finish building it, and therefore the engine won't start. Something is awry. And I think a part of that is related to this up here, this very, very, very warm water relative to average. And if we expand this out to the global Mercator projection shot of our flat Earth, haha, look at that. Just a little chuckle there. That is very, very interesting. The water is in the far north Atlantic way north there of 40 degrees latitude. I mean, we're talking way up off of Newfoundland. Remember the perfect storm with George Clooney and what was it, Eliz Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, whatever her name was. Mark Wahlberg was in that, and they said, we're going to sail out of Gloucester and go over to the Flemish Cap. This is your sword fishing area off of Newfoundland, off of Nova Scotia. I, I have no idea about sword fishing and how that works. These anomalies, look at the chart down here. Look at the legend. Let's just draw your attention right down there. Well, let's use a color that'll stand out there. Four to five degrees Celsius above average, almost off the right-hand side of the chart. First of all, is that affecting the, the sword fishing and the other fishing that goes on the overall fishing industry? If you know, please let me know in the YouTube comments. I think that would be interesting. Is this impacting marine life? This is incredibly warm relative to average. All right, these are anomalies, the departure from the long-term 30-year average. And they are so pronounced over such a large area that my theory is, and I've seen some other people kind of opine that this is their thought as well, is we're getting anomalous high pressure up here, stronger upper-level ridging, and that is allowing more of these troughs to kind of develop. I kind of drew it the wrong way. Got your upper level ridging uh, across the far north Atlantic, and then you get these troughs that develop over here, and then some more ridging to the south. It's not the best way to draw it, but it's just allowing these tuts to kind of form in here between these areas of ridging, and the way that the wave breaking goes, that these areas of high pressure go on and pinch off, that you get these upper level lows that rotate backwards like this, throughout that tut, the tropical upper tropospheric trough, and that drags in cooler, drier air from the more stable northeast Atlantic, some air off of Africa, the Canary Current down here. Yes, some of that warm, hot, dry, somewhat dusty air from the drought-stricken Europe, where the heat wave this year has been incredible. We saw that. So stuff's related. Everything's interconnected, no doubt but it's not one particular thing, and it is not dust itself. I know a lot of people say that, and you're kind of right. It's not the dust. In fact, a lot of dust in the atmosphere, um, I don't know if you know this, but if you ever stick your tongue out to catch a snowflake or a raindrop, you've got a little piece of dust and dirt on your tongue. What does water vapor attach to? It's called a condensation nuclei and it is a tiny piece of microscopic dust or something else in the atmosphere, just like when you have a glass and it's cold and you have it in a warm, humid room and it starts to develop all of that condensation on the outside. Your cold glass of 
water, in this case, we'll just say water, or an adult beverage, whatever, um, that's the condensation nuclei. It's a big old fat glass of uh, cold water, ice in there, whatever. In the atmosphere, particulate matter, dust, is what water vapor attaches to to make raindrops and snowflakes in the first place, generally speaking. So, you know, and it hasn't been just this overwhelming Armageddon type dust, you know, where it's like from the mummy or something, where just blocking out the sky, African dust has been coming off. It hasn't been that way. And if it was, clue here, folks, if we had, let's see if we got a good color. Yeah, we do. Brown. Let's say this was just ridiculous dust coming off Africa all the time out here, spreading all across the Atlantic. And I know that the graphics you see, that's what it looks like because dust looks brown. But if it's really that thick, you wouldn't have, wait for it, as they say, try to get my graphics ready here. If it was really the dust, you couldn't have this, the warmer anomalies. You can't have both because why? that thick of a dust layer would block the sun. Yes, you, if you said block the sun, you are correct. So it's not the dust. It is drier mid-level air. You've got to have a moist column all the way up, starting from the ocean, and we've got that part. But in the mid-levels of the atmosphere, it's uh, just a little bit too dry, just enough. And other factors, like I said, these tropical waves are all just kind of sitting around out there like a big old log jam, it's a supply chain issue. There you go. Remember all those ships that they said were stuck out here off the port of Los Angeles? Just lined up over 100 of them months ago. They're thinning out now. I think there's less than single digits left waiting. But it's the same kind of thing. you got these tropical waves which normally come off, and they zip across the Atlantic, and sometimes they go too fast, and they kind of get themselves sheared by the fact that they're moving too fast. They're going too fast for their own good. This year, they're not moving fast enough, so everything's kind of jammed up, and you cannot get the, the whole system to just work. It's a combination of things. But, back to this real quick, my theory is, and we'll see, look at all of this warm water here, relative to average, down in the tropics, uh, south of 30 degrees latitude right here. I know that they say generally south of 20, is considered the tropics, 10 to 20 north. But generally speaking, all of this area through here is warmer than average. We do have the La Nina, which is getting stronger. And we have lost some of the anomalies that were prevalent in the eastern Pacific. It was warmer earlier. Now these are even cooling off. No activity in the eastern Pacific. Maybe, just maybe, as we switch towards fall, and this pattern over here starts to change. We start to drop some cold air out of Canada, which is a more dense air mass. We change this overall pattern, yet we're still going to have all this warm water relative to average. And then the tropical waves come off. They may not still develop here, but they'll be stronger, get moving again. And then they end up over in this area where they start to develop, and then they become a real big problem. So my point and my theory is we still have a big impact hurricane season without 20 named storms. And I think we all know you don't need 20 named storms to have a big season. 2004 was a very active season for landfalls in the United States, but we had something like 14 or 15 named storms. It's just four of them, especially four, were very impactful. There were a couple of others. We had Alex, we had Gaston that year. But Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean were all the big ones that really took the cake that year. Even in 05, where we had 15 hurricanes form, it was Katrina, it was Dennis, it was Rita, it was Wilma for the U.S. We, we had Emily, is that what it was down there in the Yucatan, Cat 5 there early on? Yes, but I'm just saying, even in a season like 05, 28 named storms, four of them are what really mattered in terms of major impacts for the United States. So I'm going to be shifting from, all right, we're looking at a big ace year, a lot of name storms, a lot of hurricanes, to probably an average season, 70, 80, 90 ace points, somewhere around there, a little bit below average maybe. Um, and ace, by the way, is the amount of energy that these storms put out. It's a metric from a scientific perspective, quality over quantity, 
sometimes, and then what are the impacts going to be? And with all that warm water relative to average, uh, especially in the Gulf of Mexico and in the western parts of the basin over here, off the east coast, etc., yes, it is still possible to have a very impactful season. Possible. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know for sure, right? Nobody knows for sure. But this is a pretty big clue here. All that warm water relative to average, and Africa is still busy building the tropical waves, the MJO in the favorable phases to do that. The energy is not not there. It is there. It's just not doing anything as of yet. All right. All right. So let's move on. 30 years ago, great tweet here from Dakota Smith. Said, I'm finally getting around to making animations of old events. And he credits um, Dan Lindsay for helping out with that. They both work within NOAA Nesdis. And uh, where does Dakota? I just want to point this out. Atmospheric Science Communicator Creator at CIRA out there at Colorado State University. All right. So this is what he did and they did their team effort. 30 year, and I'll put this in today's uh, description. 30 year anniversary of Andrew. Andrew is what really did it for me that uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to definitely go into something related to the world of weather. I was originally going to go into music. I thought I was going to be a singer songwriter and weather would be a hobby. Um, look at that huge upper level low at the end of the satellite loop. Good work here by the team there. This is visible satellite animation. That's why it disappears when it hits Florida because this is daylight hours that we're looking at. Uh, visible, right? Uh, but yeah, 30 years ago, Andrew made history. Andrew got a lot of uh, people very interested in meteorology, especially tropical meteorology, uh, me included. I stopped uh, the music track in school or tracked whatever, took uh, a meteorology class in, I think it was like 1993 or so, the year after Andrew. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to switch over. We didn't have meteorology at UNCW where I was going to school. And so I took geography and I focused on hurricane impacts because that's what I was most interested in. And my degree was in geography with a focus on weather and climate and especially hurricanes. So I'm like a hurricane geographer, whatever. I don't even think there's a term for it. But that's what I did. And, er and, and Andrew really is what did it for me. I had other hurricanes that had sort of, quote unquote, inspired me or piqued my interest as a child. Diana, 1984, Gloria, 1985. Growing up hearing the stories of Camille, the legendary, the mysterious Camille making landfall one year before I was born. The videos of that, there's a movie out on a movie. It's a video uh, from the Department of um, Civil Defense, I think is who made it, the Department of Commerce, uh, called A Lady Called Camille on YouTube. It's sitting out there now uh, that somebody made uh, part of the Department of Defense or the Commerce Department or whatever after Camille was done. And they would show that movie uh, when I was growing up in eastern North Carolina. And anyway, Andrew's what solidified it. And I think that did it for a lot of people, especially people that were growing up as young children uh, or even teenagers in South Florida or Florida as a whole. I know my colleague Mike Watkins, Andrew was very pivotal in getting him interested in meteorology and weather and climate and all that. Uh, so 30 years ago, and you know, if something like Andrew happened again today, first of all, the technology that we have should allow us to know that that rapid intensification part is more likely to happen, giving us better warning. But way more people live down there now. And I'm going to be honest with you, something like an Andrew scenario, if you took it verbatim, that we were to repeat Andrew today, it would scare the daylights out of me, not the storm. I'll do fine protecting myself as a hurricane researcher and observer in the storm. I mean, I'm not dumb. I'm just saying it is the aftermath. So many people down there, the infrastructure that would just be completely out of commission. And Andrew was a very small hurricane. You get a larger one. You bring Irma in there without it hitting Cuba. And without that jog up through the Keys and it makes a direct hit on Miami, something like Irma or, in reality, the 1926 Great Miami Hurricane. Uh, wow. I mean, you know, Southeast Florida has been very, very fortunate. As bad as Andrew was, Greater Miami stayed out of that core. And the core is what really counts with these really, really intense hurricanes such as Andrew. So 30 years ago, 
Wow, hard to believe. This is really what did it for me. And the year after Andrew, like I said, I switched majors, went from music to geography, and here I am, all these years later, a guy with his own website, and you find people to subscribe to my channel. Good way to segue into that, right? But yeah, I mean, it was. It was, it was an inspiration. I learned a lot from it. I learned from Brian Norcross um, and different people in the news media, some of the early hurricane chasers that some of their video came out of there. Um, what an event. 30 years later, we look back on it. Luckily, nothing even remotely resembling that out there right now, but you never know when that could happen again. And it doesn't have to be Miami. It could be Charleston. It could be Houston, Corpus Christi, New Orleans, Gulfport, Myrtle Beach. You just never know. Maybe even Long Island or Atlantic City. Um, the, the poster child of it only takes one 30 years ago today. All right, if you're new to my YouTube channel, please subscribe, like the videos, make those algorithms do their thing, share as much as you can so we can get this to keep growing, and please do keep commenting. I love watching the comments. I wish I could reply to all of them. I try to do the little heart thing when, when I like it. I think that's the heart button or whatever, um, as many of them as I can to show you that I saw it. Um, I know they have the thumbs up thing. I don't know if you see it when I do that, but I appreciate it. And like I said yesterday, I'm telling you, there's only a few every year, less than a dozen, that I have to remove because they're just absurdly negative. That's pretty good considering the audience that I've got approaching 40,000 subscribers. I'll take that. I think we're doing something really positive here, and I appreciate that. Um, I guess positivity breeds positivity and attracts good and positive people. So it's great to have you along for this incredible journey. Mine, like I said, started pretty much in earnest. 30 years ago today. I was like, that's it. I'm going into hurricanes one way or the other. All right, enough for me for this afternoon. Let me get this wrapped up and put it on YouTube for you. I am Mark Suddeth, Hurricane Track. I'll be back tomorrow morning with What's Up in the Tropics. Have a good rest of your Wednesday. I'll talk to you again tomorrow morning.